Our trip to Machu Picchu started with a two-hour bus ride from our hotel in Cusco to where we boarded the train for Machu Picchu. The train has a vista dome and the view along the way is quite spectacular and includes a nice meal. The train ride takes about an hour and a half to the town of Aquas Calientes, which is the nearest town to the ruins. Once in Aquas Calientes, it is a 30 minute bus ride up a steep 13 hairpin mountain road to the actual ruins. We survived the treacherous bus ride to reach the entrance of Machu Picchu. Our passports are stamped with a commemorative logo. And Sue is excited to see that they put 50 right here. as her age. Oh, really? Yeah. This is Walter, our tour guide, and he will tell us about Machu Picchu. I want to tell you with this, that before Hiram Binga, in Machu Picchu, there were other Indians living around. Okay? That's very important. That's why I say Hiram Binga was the man who discovered Machu Picchu in a scientific way. But if we talk about who really discovered Machu Picchu, there were Indians already here living. Well, now we have that expensive hotel outside. There was one of the families living in there. Hmm. And thanks to this family and other families, Indians around Machu Picchu, the area, Hiram Binga was able to discover Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. And then later, thanks to the National Geographic, this place became to be very famous and popular. The view of the lost city is obstructed until we pass through a narrow opening in a large rock wall. And there it is in all its glory, a truly breathtaking moment. Pictures just don't give it justice. It is much more expansive than I thought. It has a mystifying sensation surrounding it with the afternoon mist rolling in. There is a lone tree in the courtyard as llamas are grazing nearby. Excavations. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Is that the right, right Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. From 1911. Yes. You see the other section there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other part? Machu Picchu was almost like that. Wow. It was covered with covered. vegetation. And there were hundreds of Indians in here in the team of Hiram Binga. And they started to cut. In order to make these terraces, archaeologists are telling us that they started above. Like boxes. Something very interesting impressed to us, my friends, was that the dirt, the fertile soil, they brought all the way from Urubamba. There are two Quechua words. Machu means old, and Picchu, mountain. Oh, yes. Old mountain. And that's the opposite. The other one we have there is the opposite, it's the Jan mountain. Why not Picchu means Jan mountain, and Machu Picchu, old mountain? This is the royal tomb, and it is carved right out of the mountain, as Walter tells us more. Astronomy. Amazing people in here. These people, because they learn generations up to generation, they develop a special system to study astronomy. And I will show you once we are in a bulb, how they did that. And I also have a picture about that Is point. this where the sun comes and focuses and shines through this window yes. at a certain time? Yes, you are completely right. Exactly. They are talking about the Temple of the Sun. On the winter solstice, 621, the sun shines directly through the eastern window and lights up a predetermined spot, highlighted in red, on a large ceremonial stone altar, which is situated in the middle of the temple. On the summer solstice, 1221, the sun shines through the southeast window and lights up the exact same spot. Can you imagine the engineering difficulty with the construction in stone and taking 12 months to confirm you have the correct orientation? Of course, if we do our normal thing, we should take a picture of this temple. This is outside of the Temple of the Sun. I am being. Wow, that's impressive. Told that this temple was covered Look how sanded with there. Possible inside or outside, like the Temple of the Sun in Cusco. We're going to see bigger rocks on the bottom, and we have the smaller rocks on top. Now, can you see some stones coming out for the walls, my friend? Yes. This is where to tie out the roofs, this one here. Walter points to the courtyard down below as more llamas are grazing. Oh, we got llamas. Now, we're going to go there later. All right, take your picture, then we go in here. All right. 
It has been a long day for all of us, especially me, since I've had little sleep going on 72 hours now. We climbed the stone steps up to a perfect vista overlooking the majestic ruins. We climb up to the high spot to take some panoramic shots as Walter takes a group picture of all of us. You want a copy cut? You can copy cut. No, 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 no. I'll tell you. We now move to the Temple of the Three Windows as Walter and Jordan tell us about it. Temple of Three Windows. Ah, Three Windows. Each window is representing one spiritual world. Upper world is one in the world. But Jun has something else to tell us. So the number three was an important number for them. So that's why you can see Three Windows Temple in here. And also, let's focus on this stone here. You know, it's a nice detail. This stone well known as the Chacan, with, or the Inca cross, with three steps in every side. So, he, uh, this upper uh, step could represent the upper world, this world, the underworld. world, Condor, Puma, and Snake. Those were the sacred animals that the Incas had during those times. You know, and we only see the half of it. What about the rest of it? In the colony is when they started to dig out around this rock, they didn't find the half of this uh, of this rock, you know, in order to complete like this. So during the winter solstice, when the sun beams hits the rock, it will project a shadow on the ground to complete the chakan. So then you can see that beam pocket, beam pocket, in comparison with this beam pocket, that's finished and that work is not finished. That means this temple was under construction. Do you think your house is finished? You see, your cities, your states are, are finished. No, you're always improving things as human beings. They were human beings and they used to improve their stuff, their architecture and so on. You can see the column in here with an indentation on top to hold on the lintel that came across. Isn't it? This used to have an open facade, you know, and the house for the priest who was in charge of this temple around was the one we can see it from here on the left hand side. And you can easily recognize when the by the architecture, isn't it? It's not as fancy as this place because this is a temple and that one is just a house, you know, dedicated to the highest priest who was in charge of this area, of this square. Here I am at the main temple and pointing out one of the few areas of the ruins that have shifted over time. There are many theories on the cause for this wall to earthquakes, which they don't have, to the foundation being made of sacred sand that just washed away. The temple of Huiracocha, temple of three windows, and the house of the high priest over there. Uh -huh. Special ceremonies in here, connection with the other one we have. Question, please? The architecture of this temple is called Weiranda by having only three of the usual four walls. Still in the sacred plaza, Walter tells us more. If we see carefully the corners, one, two, three, four, which are represented the four cardinal points. North, south, east and west. If you have a compass, you're going to see clearly those cardinal points. And this was part of the constellations. June 21st, we came here, same that in the other one, we have a special shadow on the ground. Looks like a llama head. Hmm. Exactly that, and that's for about five, four minutes more or less. If you see the bunch of rock we have there, it was the main quarry stone of Machu Picchu. There were many, but this was the main one. And according to geologists, the rocks collapsed from that big mountain hundred years before the Inca. Making of the place, my friends, the right place to make a city. So when Pachacute was here with his people, he saw all this and he found these materials and a flat place. This is the place we're going to build Machu Picchu. The stones were not transformed from long distances. The stones were here. The rocks were here. And we're talking about natural rock granite formation. Power is coming from there, all the weight supporting it here, that's why we have this rock. Yeah. But not everywhere. In order to separate the power of the energy coming from above or from bottom, they made this. But that one, how do you call those? Intersection or keystones? Over there? 
Keystones. Keystones. Great, more steps. Now Jordan tells us about this magical stone. I'm sticking out from the boulder. That's where they used to tie up the llama and the golden disc. Because the idea of these people was to attach the sun in there. The local chief town that was in charge of much picture used to climb here and sit over there, you know, and wait for the summer solstice because that throne is this stone is one of the many ritual stones in South America. This carved stone altar, whose shadow marks the changing seasons, enabled Inca priests to predict such events as the winter solstice, which marks the beginning of the harvest and sowing. Researchers believe that it was built as an astronomic clock or calendar. You are not able to touch it though. You can put your hands as close as you can and you can absorb a bit of the energy. Shirley McLean once visited the sacred stone and claims, just as our human body has chi, life forces, running through it, so does Earth. Sue and others try their hand at it. Jordan tells us about the water mirrors. The water mirror is spejos de agua. Spejos means mirrors. Agua means water. Water mirrors. Incas used to reflect their stars, constellations. Eclipses, you know, through the reflection of the water they could see and observe their stars, you know. And we can get blind, we can burn our eyes. That's why back during the Inca's times they built these water mirrors to reflect their eclipses too. Isn't it? Through the reflection they could observe the eclipses and so on. <clears throat> like the sexton they use in the Navy, you know, to measure angles. Back during those times they used these water mirrors to measure, but measure the angles of the sky. And so. Uh, the archaeologists didn't know how to explain why the Incas, you know, always uh, carved out the stones, you know, in cooperation or in the shape with the constellations, but upside down. And the answer is this, because they used what the mirrors back during those times to study the sky. Bob points out that an eerie mist is rolling in. We make our way down to the Temple of the Condor. Well, for all the perspective, but all the tools we found in yeah. here, artifacts yeah. and tools, and also some llama bones, we believe that this was the Temple of the Condor. And the Condor was an animal symbolizing a connection with the upper world, a messenger from the God. I was reading a book from the colonial time, the Spaniards said that when the Inca sacrificed llamas and alpacas, usually they took the heart and the lungs when the animal was alive. Oh, okay. And that? then the rest of the body, they make special decorations, necklaces made of gold and silver, and they brought all the way to the top of the mountains. For what reason? Take it up and take it hands. And that was the rest of the offering to go to the upper world. That the conception, they put it here to this temple is shaped like the body of a condor. The Incas overcame many obstacles to construct this impressive citadel on the fringe of a mountain over 8,000 feet above sea level. They engineered a running water system that still operates today after being abandoned for 500 years. This is the view of Sungate, and you can see the trail that we're going to hike on early tomorrow morning. That's going to be our goal tomorrow. And now, look at the trail we have. The next morning, it is drizzling as we start our hike to Sungate. On the way, we take frequent stops to photograph this amazing landscape. The lighting is much different this time in the morning with the mist in the air. You getting hot? Whew. You got a little oxygen. 
Oh yeah, that would have been a good idea. Bob, look up. Okay. Yeah, you can Jordan helps us over this large, slippery rock. I oh, didn't see this rock. <laughs> Eight thousand three hundred and sixty four. Does that sound right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We continue on this long hike to Sungate as the rain stops. We all set? Yes, sir. We all set. There are more ahead. Yeah, Leslie and Sue will we'll see them on the way back down maybe. They go, they always walk really fast. So Bob and I are usually like way back and we can barely see them and then they don't even look back. And they, oh, they're like two miles ahead of us everywhere we go. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah, they're quick, they go zoom. Bob is leading the way up these wet, narrow rock steps as one misstep could be your last. Old now. This is the view of the 13 hairpin switchbacks we took on the bus to get here. That was almost as exciting as a ride at Disneyland, with the difference being that you are likely to survive the Disneyland ride. We are almost there as it's getting steeper and more difficult to climb up on the rocks. We haven't seen Leslie or Sue for a while, but wait, I hear them up ahead. Hello. <laughs> are they there yet? No kidding. Well, there's nobody there to take your picture. There's nobody there to take your picture. That's right. I think I'm stopping here. There's nice shots here. Hold on, let me get your picture. I can see why you married that woman. <laughs> Finally, we are all here with only a few steps left to go. Up at the top of Sungate, it gets a bit chilly as we all celebrate reaching the summit. He's going to take our pictures. I'm gonna get over here by the rock so it's not cold. I took my coat off. We pose for more photos at the entrance of Sungate. Very much set. Right there. Right there. Is that okay? Yeah. Jordan now takes pictures of us behind the Sungate plaque. Wait a minute. Don't go anywhere. Just turn and look this way. The hike to Sungate took us about an hour and a half as we head back to Machu Picchu.
we make several stops to take more photos of this amazing scenery. Since we made good time on the way back, we now have enough time to hike to the Inca Bridge. However, this hike is much more treacherous. Just look at the sheer cliff this trail is on top of. One misstep on this wet, slippery rock and it's all over. Here I need both poles to support my weight as I attempt to go down this steep grade. Thanks for saving my life. I slipped on a wet rock, but Jordan was there. More wet, narrow ledges to walk on as the rest of my group is way ahead of me. I meet up with the rest of our tour group as we pose for more photos. Sure. I'll just lay him here. Now it is getting much more difficult, and they have installed a cable to hold on for this last precarious section. Can you see how narrow this ledge is? And it's very, very high. I can't believe I'm actually doing this since I'm terrified of heights. At this point, it is a 1,700 foot straight down drop to the river below while walking on a three foot wide ridge with no railings. That is 250 feet higher than the Empire State Building. You coming back? Yeah, just get Angela here. Bob's taking pictures. Okay. If you want to go take pictures. Sue passes me on this narrow ridge like any other afternoon stroll. I finally get to the end where I can meet up with Leslie and Bob. I turn to get a 360 degree panoramic view of the mountains. I'm going to go a little further. Just want to get a panoramic. What's down here? Bridge out? Yeah. <laughs> This is the famous Inca bridge that they would pull back the wooden planks to keep their enemies away. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been for the Incas to get to Machu Picchu as this is the only way in from the north? Well, I made it to the Inca bridge as I head on back. As usual, I have a difficult time keeping up with Sue and company as they are patiently waiting for me. This was a fantastic journey to the lost city of Machu Picchu.